everybody. Reporting to you again from the Glamour City, Hollywood. In America, 50 million people use a propane-powered grill. Five million people use it in their home to primary heat. But as you're correct, most, most people don't really think about propane. Um, as we really think about traditional uses, it's been beyond the natural gas main, home heat, heating water, cooking, on the agriculture for keeping animals warm or drying grain. But as we really think about the future, we, we don't believe it will be. We are seeing firsthand that it is being used in really three new markets, power generation, both from, from residential to grid scale. Um, we, we are the power, we're the fuel for the Virgin Islands in their power gen, the fuel for most of the Caribbean as we think about it. And frankly, often in concert with solar or wind, that's where we tend to promote it. But big applications in power gen, whether you're talking about two kilowatts or gigawatt scale. And that, that's really new for us as we think about those larger scale. And then to replace engine driven applications, transportation for sure. Um, and again, we have, we have not adopted a one size fits all approach, right? We don't, we're not really talking about passenger cars. We think what people want to drive for their consumer facing transportation is, is fine. We've really adopted to be more in the medium duty space, school buses, those, those trucks that deliver your packages to your home or you know, beverage delivery, all of that medium duty space. And then lastly, it's in material hand, uh, mainly aimed at diesel centric port activity, uh, big forklifts, cargo stackers, and then the trucks that move around in a port. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Tucker Perkins, President and CEO of Propane Education and Research Council. Welcome to the show today. Scott, thanks for having me. I look forward to our conversation. So, Tucker, let's get some basics out. I think most of us have used propane, of course, on a consumer basis. Let's get into some of the more fundamentals. Propane, of course, is a three-carbon alkane. It's a molecular formula of C3H8. And it belongs in the liquefied petroleum gases along with butane, propylene, butadiene, and a number of others. But I want to ask you, specific to propane, some of the key characteristics in terms of the lower volumetric energy density and the higher gravimetric energy density properties, and how does that translate into both the use, but also maybe perhaps maybe relative to petrol or gasoline uh, versus maybe even coal, for instance? Yeah, so Scott, you're already ahead of 98.9% of the population, how you've already explained it. But simply, one, I think to Americans, it's important as we really rethink energy independence and energy security. Propane today comes from uh, where we really clean up natural gas. So it's one of the heavier things in natural gas. Unlike natural gas, propane contains no methane. And as we really have harsh looks around how do we impact our climate through reduced greenhouse gases? Propane is one of those lucky fuels that actually doesn't contain methane, is actually very low global warming potential. But to your exact question, I would like to think all the other chemicals you mentioned, really people don't realize unless they're in the petrochemical world. Um, propane is really the next step from natural gas. Most Americans would think of it as the fuel that they would use if they don't have access to the natural gas main. So urban areas generally use natural gas. Rural areas beyond the gas mains would consider propane. Beyond, beyond the fact that it doesn't contain methane, and that's a wonderful tool as we have an environmental conversation, it also easily is stored as a liquid and then often used as a vapor. So as we think about future rules against diesel, against gasoline, the, the use, the storage, the, the consumer interface, if you will, is very similar with a couple key characteristics. Much cleaner compared to diesel, redu reduction in NOx emissions can be 97, 98%, reduction in particulate matter, nearly 100%. Even in the modern engines we begin to talk about now, greenhouse gases, 
are cut 25 or more percent. So as we think about uh, the emissions profile of consuming propane compared to consuming gasoline or diesel, much, much cleaner, uh, easier to store. If you were to, you know, we are all live in a world where our eyes are in Ohio right now. And we're thinking about chemicals interacting with the groundwater and the unintended release. Propane doesn't interact with groundwater, doesn't in, interact with the soil. So stores much easier. One of the reasons that UPS has enjoyed it. One of the reasons we see kind of a resurgence in the marine world is it's quite, it's quite good uh, in environmentally sensitive areas because it doesn't contaminate soil or groundwater. So a lot of nice features, but if I could characterize it right simply, very clean when it's burned, uh, quite clean if it were to escape. And then lastly, stores easily, transports easily, and then has high energy, uh, high energy density for some of these modern applications, whether it's in your furnace or in an engine. So I, I think, um, you know, the thing that's important to kind of set the base, uh, baseline for those that are listening is that it's all relative. I think what we're talking about is relative terms. Certainly it's not as clean as, let's say, true renewable energy, but relative to the stack of other types of petrol base or LP uh, gases, it is cleaner. So I think that's that's an important piece of it. Now, one of the things that you do mention, which is this notion of storage and transportation, I think it is very germane, is that when we think about um, large-scale renewables and potentially converting that into, let's say, liquid hydrocarbons or ammonia, for instance, the challenge with that is uh, it needs a, a lot of a lot of really energy-intensive uh, capabilities to get it to a certain temperature, very cold temperature so that it can be transported and be exported, let's say, from Australia to Japan or other parts, for example. Uh, propane doesn't have those kind of um, you know, requirements, correct? Correct. In fact, can I, I'm going to come to that. I'm going to back up because I think we study often, you know, how is regular propane, conventional propane, how does it stack up against this basket of other fuels? And you're certainly right. You know, when we start talk, comparing ourselves to renewable fuels, I, I, I want, uh, maybe we'll talk about that in a bit, but let me just start. We look often at the carbon intensity of conventional propane today compared to the carbon intensity of the conventional grid today. And I, I'm shocked. Uh, the carbon intensity of the grid across the U.S., if you take all the inputs, it's something in excess of 150. Uh, and we could go through the units, but just, just we'll hold that for a second. The carbon intensity of propane is essentially half that. It's 80. So conventional propane today is nearly twice as clean as the electric grid today. The Propane today is, is much cleaner, in fact, than gasoline or diesel. And then lastly, we can talk about it later, but our renewable components, uh, a year ago, our renewable propane components still had a carbon intensity of 11 or 12 or 13. Now we actually are beginning to develop sources that are carbon zero. And the, the next generation of those look to be significantly negative in carbon. So uh, to, to your question, because actually I come from the LNG world and you know, in the LNG world, you spend a lot of time getting liquefied natural gas to behave at minus 257 degrees Fahrenheit. Propane gets to a liquid state at minus 44. Mm -hmm. So it's relative, it's easily stored as a liquid form, easily compressed. I mean, in the LNG world or the compressed natural gas world, you spend a lot of time with high pressure compressors using a lot of electricity mm -hmm. or energy to compress. With propane, we do it. Off, we usually do it with a five horsepower motor that consumes about the same amount of energy as a light bulb, frankly. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think for those, again, I think because of the fact that propane has more of a consumer facing component for listeners is to really help them to understand that it plays a pretty critical role in terms of infrastructure, such as transportation ports, some of the global energy markets, and certainly power grids and backup power. So talk to us about some of those kind of larger things that unless you're in those industrial uh, sectors, you're not going to have visibility for the average consumer. Yeah, it's always amazing to me as I travel really around the country or the world, people will often say, no, I don't know propane at all. And I'll say, well, it's the fuel in, in your grill. In, American, in America, 50 million people use a propane-powered grill. 5 million people use it in their home to primary heat. But as you're correct, most, most people don't really think about propane. Um, as we really think about traditional uses, it's been beyond the natural gas main, home heat, heating water, cooking on the agriculture for keeping animals warm or drying grain. But as we really think about the future, 
we, we don't believe it will be. We are seeing firsthand that it is being used in really three new markets, power generation, both from, from residential to grid scale. Um, we, we are the power, we're the fuel for the Virgin Islands in their power gen, the fuel for most of the Caribbean as we think about it, and frankly, often in concert with solar or wind, that's where we tend to promote it. But big applications in power gen, whether you're talking about two kilowatts or gigawatt scale. And that, that's really new for us as we think about those larger scale. And then to replace engine-driven applications, transportation for sure. Um, and again, we have, we have not adopted a one-size-fits-all approach, right? We don't, we're not really talking about passenger cars. We think what people want to drive for their consumer-facing transportation is, is fine. We've really adopted to be more in the medium-duty space, school buses, those, those trucks that deliver your packages to your home or you know, beverage delivery, all of that medium-duty space. And then lastly, it's in material hand, uh, mainly aimed at diesel-centric port activity, uh, big forklifts, cargo stackers, and then the trucks that move around in a port. I was recently in Hawaii uh, on a project, had a chance to visit the port, and it was shocking to me to see a place that's just really interested in their environmental footprint, how much uh, they were contaminating by using diesel when they had an opportunity to use propane. We see a massive migration now. The port of Newark has seen the value in propane-powered equipment in their port. They're making a wholesale shift. Long Beach, California, and we really see a lot of ports and a lot of fleets beginning to adopt. It's cleaner than, stores better than, and much, much cheaper than diesel. So I'm going to come back to some of these kind of more granular things I want to discuss around energy production, supply chain, and even manufacturing to a great extent. But uh, the reason I want to kind of take a step back is to kind of look at the bigger, let's say, narrative or maybe backdrop that's happening. And, and certainly it's hard not to talk about the Ukraine invasion and the kind of ripple effect that it's had on traditional oil and gas markets. And clearly, based on some of the key infrastructure sectors that you're talking about, we're highly vulnerable. And, and it provides a way for us to have an alternative, especially when the commodities markets or even access. I remember, I think, going into the winter, Fortunately, the winter turned out to be kind of mild, at least the earlier part. Uh, we didn't use as much natural gas, for instance, but certainly it's it's been an issue. Scarcity is an issue. So talk to us about the geopolitics and the defense uh, implications and why it's important for us to have alternative uh, sources for energy. It was interesting to see BP come out with their earnings release and see the chairman talk there about really the war in Ukraine has, has really changed the conversation around security and price, those two issues. And I think particularly as we sit here in America talking about American propane, the first thing you got to realize is we are the world's leading producer of propane by far. And we, for years, I mean, in fact, in the natural gas world, you know, we all talk about this LNG export, but the truth is we export about 13% of our natural gas production from the U.S. We export today about 70% of our propane production in the U.S. It's, we, are, we have massive amounts of propane produced, about 27, 28 billion gallons a year. And today we are already the primary exporter to uh, most of Central America, most all of South America, large gaps of Asia and even parts of China. Um, so we start with this bountiful surplus that we've been exporting, and we continue to see these opportunities to begin to replace diesel fuel. Not all diesel fuel in all applications, but in these niche applications, power gen, ports, transportation. And you know we're, we're beginning to come to market now with a massive project with Cummins Engine Company. Their next generation engine features propane among a suite of other fuels. We had this study with with Cummins, because we, we we say we produce about 30 billion gallons, if you will, think about a little bit of growth in the natural gas industry. We consume about 10 billion gallons domestically in the U.S. today. So we have this difference, if you will, of nearly 20 billion gallons. We, get, we know we could grow that market 10 or 12 billion gallons without even impacting price for anyone. And so uh, the war, the war, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine certainly changed a lot around diesel fuel, gasoline, natural gas into Europe. Those flows changed natural gas from America into Europe. 
It really didn't change a lot for propane production in the U.S. or even the propane export scheme, which has been relatively constant. Um, the wild card geopolitically, frankly, is what does China do with plastics? Um, you know, really, a lot of these plants, one of the basic building blocks of plastics can be propane, and that's a big swing in our demand performance the last couple of years, though. The lighter, the lighter parts of the natural gas barrel, specifically ethane, have been, you know, really what's been used for plastics. I would say, and actually I'm speaking to the industry, the producing industry next week uh, in California, and, you know, we'll see, but the industry really see, is supportive and uh, interested in seeing these domestic markets develop. It's better, it's better for Americans who get access to this cleaner, uh, more affordable energy and the producers like it because they keep this uh, U.S. produced propane at home. So, so going back to what we just talked about before, before this kind of geopolitical context is um, one of the areas we talked about was energy production. So in the case of, uh, let's say, power plants, uh, for them to retrofit to consume propane, is there, is there really a net retrofit or is it kind of a plug and play? What's needed for those systems to start to consume propane on a large scale? For most of those systems, those large industrial scale systems, it is almost, almost as you say, plug and play. Um, most of the technology is sophisticated enough to say, hey, I was running natural gas, perhaps I was running diesel fuel, now I'll run propane, and the technology is quite simple. In fact, something that I didn't see happening, but propane is becoming a fuel for shipping, actually the fuel that powers the ships. Uh, you know, used to be bunker fuel, this horribly dirty, heavy diesel fuel, and now we knew that's not appropriate. Um, I really thought LNG would be a fuel of the future. We see these ships are pretty easily able to move from bunker fuel to using uh, propane. The, the technology is there to do that. Um, if we think about your house or my house or a residential generator, a little you know, it's a little bit more purpose built. Um, so you wouldn't just certainly you wouldn't think about well, it's designed to run on gasoline or diesel. Let me run it on propane. It's not nearly that simple. Um, but it, it most Generac, for example, uh, their systems are designed to run either natural gas or propane. Uh, at at the installation level, you make a a, a choice a choice there. Um, and then I would say in transportation, we don't really recommend uh, diesel engines using propane. We're we're looking for these modern purpose built propane engines. So we recommend for school buses for trucks. It's at the time of uh, resale when you're ready to buy a new vehicle. You buy this new purpose-built engine that has the same durability profile you're used to with diesel, actually the same thermal efficiencies that you were used to diesel, much cheaper to operate, much cleaner for the environment, and frankly, much cleaner for our health, I might, I might add. So, so it sounds like a, it's, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? So some sectors, it's fairly almost no retrofit whatsoever, whereas in the case of some of these engines I used to maybe consume diesel, you'll have to look to different kind of combustion technologies that can consume and utilize propane more efficiently. So that's a different kind of a capex and a transition. So in terms of uh, behavioral behavioral and change management is that so many of these different industries are used to signing certain long-term contracts for different energy supplies. How easy or difficult is it for them to switch and change the mindset to propane? Well, I always applaud you for talking about behavioral change managing. As I think, as we think about this, inner, the broader energy transition, I think that's the one piece that few people really give enough credit to is just how difficult it is to get people to do something different than what they've already done. I would say for today, the world is pretty simple because we give most of these fleet managers or even consumers, the experience feels somewhat similar to what they used to do. I, I fueled my car this way. I fueled my truck this way. I'm still fueling my vehicle this way. It feels to a, to them a bit the same. What's really changing us for that commercial or industrial mindset is the price difference is astonishing. Uh, it was quoted yesterday, so I can say it, a, a fleet manager powering his school bus fleet, he, he reported that he was paying 79 cents a gallon for propane and about $4 a gallon for diesel fuel. Um, gives him in round numbers an 80% cost savings in his operating cost of his fleet. 
So one of the ways to really accelerate change management is to give a fleet manager or even a property manager such a compelling economic story. We marry that to such a compelling environmental story, and it really sets up people that really are legitimately concerned about ESG issues. It gives them really a win in each one of those, an economic inf- incentive and a massive environmental incentive. So one of the things that I think, um, you know, our podcast is a little bit more nuanced than maybe other climate change podcasts is that we recognize that switching over to renewable energy or just going essentially getting to closer to net zero isn't just flip flip of a switch. It's, it's, you don't just turn, turn, simply turn it on or off. And like we talked about before is there's a lot of kind of industrial manufacturing supply chain applications but we don't necessarily see it, but yet it's so critical to our infrastructure and just the running of our economy. So, you know, I think it's it's foolish to say that we can easily get rid of the oil, oil and gas industry overnight, because the reality is it's going to be around for a long time. The question is, in what form and where is it going to be hardest to uh, wean off? Now, with that said... Assuming that propane has a role in the in this transition, what do you say to those people that says, well, you know, your cause and propane's uh, cause, it's really more of a PR campaign in the form of gaslighting to prop up oil and gas in industry longer? Yeah, I think those people that say that, one, haven't studied any of the emissions data. Perhaps, perhaps they haven't studied any of the emissions data of the current electric grid or diesel, but they're certainly not looking at the total fuel cycle how you would want to say it, well to wheels, cradle to grave, however you need to do it, which is exactly where we study. In fact, five years ago, I think I was probably the only engineer on staff. We now have three PhDs. Two of them just work on emissions model. So what I would say is clearly there is a goal to get the net zero. I perhaps am not one that believes the electric grid will ever truly be net zero. And I think um, I understand that we're trying to get there, but the data is out this week that showed the grid went backwards in carbon intensity from 2019 to 2021. It actually became more carbon intense in the U.S. rather than less carbon intense. So I would say to them, they're incorrect. If you really are honest and intellectually truth about the emissions profile of the propane vehicle, you see that it is arguably one of the best choices today. How long is that window open? I don't know because I'm not really here to predict battery technology. Certainly battery technology is going to improve. Uh, engines will continue to improve. But I'll say, Scott, the last thing about this is I was in that predicament seven, eight years ago as we're working with different uh, governments and, and managements. And they said, well, what is your path to net zero? Right? You cannot be a fuel of the future without a path to net zero. And we began thinking about, and we'd always worked about propane uh, a big effort in propane and net zero homes, right? Always in concert with solar or wind. And sometimes, you know, today we're doing microgrids, uh, wonderful microgrids that are always propane solar or propane wind. But it, we began to think about what is our pathway to a renewable fuel? Can we get to a, a zero carbon fuel in a truly intellectually honest issue? And a year ago, we came from the same place renewable diesel comes from, you know, hydro treating fats and oils, uh, carbon intensity is 11. Um, and so a world where we think about renewable diesel or sustainable aviation fuel, that pathway is there. I'm happy to really say that a plant's being built today in California that will actually take a non-food cover crop. It's called Camelina plant. Um, so non-food works with the current farmer's rotation of crops, drought tolerant, easily converts to propane. And when it does, we believe it's going to be at least carbon zero. We probably think it's going to be a little negative. And some work that we're doing now, we're be- it's licensed and we're beginning to move into pilot stage, Takes has us taking waste methane streams, stream, with methane streams that are stranded, that are currently just going into the atmosphere. And we really believe those streams, uh, we, have the, we have the technologies proven, that will have a carbon intensity probably of minus 100 or some you know, deeply negative carbon score. And, and we see volume there well in excess of a billion gallons, even with our current view. So, so anyone who says, I don't believe that propane or its renewable uh, cousin will be a fuel of the future, 
they're not really looking at the emissions profile of the current suite of fuels, the basket of potential fuels, um, and then really thinking through those tough issues like access, affordability, um, and the emissions profile. So, you know, certainly in the air, airline industry, we've seen a big movement towards a different kind of fuel, mostly uh, through, I think, fermented types of plant base or, or different types of waste. Uh, and I think that's what you're referring to as well as different sources that, that that can essentially be created into a derivative of propane. And I'm just trying to figure out in the long term, and again, I don't know if that's seven years or 10 years or 30 years, what percentage will that make up or will propane, you know, to a great extent, will continue to be, you know, sourced in the traditional way uh, as we have always done? Well, I'm always quick to say that until the electric grid is is cleaner in carbon than propane, I'll never be an apologist for conventional propane, that we we see a complete place to put this conventional propane that's already twice as clean as the electric grid is today. So I'm never going to be an apologist for conventional propane in, in a narrow conversation around the climate, right? I can go to a broader conversation around health and equity and access and all these other things, and even the story gets broader. But certainly we see for the transportation-based fuels competing against gasoline and diesel, we see enough production capacity right now, not, not in place right now, but the contracts that we see forming with Chevron or uh, Marathon or, you know, Diamond Green, which is, you know, Valero and uh, a few other partners, we see that, that volume approaching a billion gallons, which is more than our current transportation volume. We take, we take market share from diesel. Um, we really believe that can be five or six million gallons and uh, excuse me, billion gallons. And I think what, where, where we're watching, clearly that market is driven by these low carbon fuel standards is driven by the RENS credits that flow to producers. And we, we stand on top of that. We actually not really in that battle. We just stand by to watch it. And if we think the RENS credits expand and low carbon fuel standards expand to more uh, markets, then I think you'll see our supply of conventional and renewable propane expand. One of the beauty th- one of the beauties of renewable propane, it's a perfect drop-in for propane. An engine, a water heater, anything can, ready to run regular propane is already ready to run uh, renewable propane. So I think we're really just driven by market demand. So last year, uh, you know, oil, the, the oil and gas corporations have reaped an incredible historic profits. I'm not even talking revenues, but profits such as in the double digit billions, uh, absolutely unheard of, truly hi- historical and unprecedented. And though you guys are in a similar basket, but for all purposes from a lobbying and from a market, you guys are distinct from the diesel and the gasoline and certainly natural gas as well. Uh, wouldn't those bigger players continue to want to exercise market share and market dominance and not let propane come in? Well, I mean, it is interesting. I think even though propane is a derivative of producing natural gas, I think, you know, really the those dominant fuels, you just hit them, natural gas, diesel, and gasoline. But no, I, I would say my my dealings, even at an at a executive level with the large uh, large utilities, they we all are in agreement that we we need to move to a better place, that we need we need to get to a cleaner climate, and we need to do that by having this wide path, I'm quick to say, of all the the right options. So I'm one that says, yes, I think diesel will be here for a long time, but I don't think it's for that reason, Scott. I really don't. I think it's because, as you've already said, change management is going to be hard to come by, and there aren't really affordable uh, and reliable options. But I, I do think, look, we see it all the time. I start every day not thinking about how can I preserve the market share of propane. I, we really don't start that way. We start with and I, I think maybe we are a bit unique. How does propane fit into this moving uh, economy, into this moving narrative around a climate and health and affordability and access and equity? And then we're investing in, in the systems that we believe will be relevant a decade from now. So just as a, a concluding comment uh, from my point of view is that, again, I, I don't think it's you know as much as both sides paint a very simplistic picture. It's a lot more multi-layered and there's a lot of um, 
you know, kind of complexity to it, including, for example, the geopolitics and some of the defense matters we talked about. For instance, uh, Qatar, for example, has really filled in for natural gas. Uh, they primarily have sourced into the East Asia and Southeast Asia, but they've also funneled it into Europe to meet some of the some of the shortages and gaps, for instance. And Australia is also coming into play. And I think it's important for the U.S. to have a strong position, uh, not only from a domestic, but also export. So that we're not just relying upon some of these other you know, international actors to fill in those gaps, because ultimately, whoever controls resources, whether it's energy, food, uh, and semiconductor, or just about anything else, really also plays into the overlap of geopolitics. And so to that end, uh, I've been joined by Tucker Perkins, President and CEO of Propane Education and Research Council. Thanks for joining today. Scott, thank you for a great discussion. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.